So a wealthy American who likes to hunt goes to Africa and shoots and kills an endangered animal, a lion, say, or a black rhino, and it is legal because he has a license, one that he paid thousands or even tens or hundreds of thousands for, but sometimes when word gets out about the kill, outrage follows. The hunter is severely criticized by animal rights activists and by some environmentalists who condemn the act, insisting that animals need to be protected, not hunted. But wait, some hunters say, we are the good guys here. Our sport, as they call it, is the best thing that has ever happened to wild animals. We hunters are history's first true conservationists and still it's most effective. Not just the millionaires who are trophy hunting in Africa, but also the deer and the duck hunters in the United States from Maine to Montana. Hunters conserve wildlife, they say, they argue. So what about that? Well, that sounds like the makings of a good debate, so let's have it. Yes or no to this statement, hunters conserve wildlife. A debate from Intelligence Squared US. I'm John Donvan. We are at the Kaufman Music Center in New York with four superbly qualified debaters who will argue for and against this motion, hunters conserve wildlife. As always, our debate will go in three rounds and then our live audience here in New York votes to choose the winner and only one side wins. Before we get to the introductions, let's get to your vote. Take a look at this motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife. Now there is a keypad at your seat, and if you go to that keypad, you need to pay attention only to keys number one, two, and three. If you agree with this motion, we'd like you to push number one. If you disagree, push number two. And if you are undecided, push number three. The other keys are not live, so you can ignore them. And if you felt that you entered the incorrect vote, just correct yourself. And while the system is still open, the, car, the, the piece will record your latest vote into our computer. Does anybody need more time? It looks like everybody's complete. Okay, so that's our preliminary vote. I want to explain that we're going to have you vote a second time after you have heard all of the arguments for and against the motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife. And in the end, it's the difference between the first and the second vote in percentage points that determines our winners. So you'll be voting a second time after you hear all of the arguments. Let's meet our debaters first. Let's uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Anthony Licata. Anthony, welcome to Intelligence Squared. Thanks for having me. So uh, Anthony, you are you're, you're editor-in-chief of Field and Stream magazine. That has an audience of more than 9 million hunters and fishermen. You yourself have been hunting since you were 10 years old. You took a trip out to Alaska on a black bear hunt. You did not come back with a bear. So what made it so memorable for you? Uh, hunting is about a lot more than just taking an animal. On that trip to Alaska, I absolutely fell in love with Southeast Alaska, and that's what made it so memorable. Thank you, Anthony. And tell us who is your partner in this debate. My partner is Catherine Semser. Catherine, welcome to Intelligence Squared. And Catherine Semser, you are uh, Chief Operating Officer of Humanitarian Operations Protecting Elephants. That's an NGO mm -hmm. that works with governments and other organizations to fight against poaching in Africa. And it seems like every time a controversy comes up involving trophy hunting, people tend to conflate um, legal hunting and what is called poaching. So in a couple of sentences, educate us, what's the difference between legal hunting and poaching? Sure, a hunter is someone who pays a fee to pursue game within the context of a conservation program that has government oversight. A poacher, in contrast, is an outlaw who illegally kills game to supply illicit markets around the world. The key difference is that hunters support conservation programs and poachers actively undermine them. Okay, a topic we'll be coming back to, and thank you. And this is the team arguing for the motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife. And we have two debaters arguing against it first, Wayne Pacelli. Wayne, welcome to Intelligence Squared. Thank you very much. Wayne, you are president, you are also CEO of the Humane Society of the United States. That is an animal advocacy organization that provides direct care to more than 150,000 animals every year. Uh, you've always loved animals, but in your youth, apparently, I understand your knowledge was encyclopedic, literally. <laughs> 
Well, it was. I, I had all of the encyclopedias, some old Britannica encyclopedias, dog-eared to all of the animal entries, the polar bears and the pronghorns and all the other animals. So I couldn't get enough information when I was a kid about animals. All right. Thanks, Wayne Paselli. Yes. And who is your partner? My f good friend, Adam Roberts. Glad to have him here. Adam <laughs> Roberts, welcome to Intelligence Squared. You are CEO of Born Free USA and Born Free Foundation. Those are organizations that work toward protecting wildlife in natural habitats. Uh, your organization helped uh, sponsor a law um, under the Endangered Species Act, a change in the law that protects lions as of 2016. What does that protection mean? Does that mean that lions will never be hunted? No, really, it's, it's not the end. It's the beginning of lion conservation by ensuring that American trophy hunters don't play a part in the ongoing demise of the species. Okay, and again, something that we'll be getting to tonight in our debate, our team arguing against the motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife. Okay, so uh, you've met our debaters. Now we move on to round one. Round one are opening statements by each debater in turn. They will be seven minutes each and they will be uninterrupted speaking first in support of the motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife. Catherine Semser, she is COO of Humanitarian Operations Protecting Elephants, a nonprofit anti-poaching organization. Ladies and gentlemen, Catherine Semser. Thank you, everyone. I really feel that I should not be up here tonight. I really feel like the person who should be here talking about African wildlife is somebody from Africa, from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, from Namibia, from Mozambique. Somebody who has to live with that wildlife and somebody who has to live with the consequences of the policies that the United States and the EU often implement in relation to that wildlife. But I'm here and I appreciate the invitation. I think this is gonna be an interesting debate because Wayne, Adam, and I agree on a lot. Um, first and foremost, we agree that wildlife is valuable and should be conserved. I think all of you feel the same, otherwise you wouldn't be here this evening. Wayne and I agree that factory farming is bad for people, animals, and the environment. And Adam's organization, Born Free, just recently joined the International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, which I also serve as a volunteer. It's the largest network of conservation professionals in the world. So welcome, Adam. If you came here looking for the brawls that usually characterize this topic, I hope you're gonna leave disappointed. Anthony and I are not zealots, we're not absolutists, we're realists. And that realism along with our personal experience is what leads us to the position that hunters conserve wildlife. And it's a position I hope you will vote in favor of this evening. We're gonna share with you stories from Africa's poaching wars. We're gonna talk about the success of the North American model of wildlife conservation. We're gonna share figures and realities that we have gained through boots on the ground experience, working with lions, elephants, Cape buffalo, sable, in places where photo tourists will not go because they're what we call a non-permissive environment places that are dangerous, remote, but hunters will go there, and hunters are the ones who are conserving these places. Little fun fact, do you know that hunting concessions have conserved an area in Africa 1.7 times the size of the U.S. National Park System? That is a huge chunk of conservation land. How much of our national park system are we willing to put into jeopardy on the African continent. I'm gonna share some stories about why hunters conserve wildlife. One place we work is called Katata 11 in Mozambique. It's an area of about 2.5 million acres. To put that into perspective, it's an area about the size of Yellowstone National Park. As many of you probably know, during the 1990s, Mozambique saw a absolutely brutal civil war. Horrific. If you're not familiar with it, you should become familiar with it because it's something that should never happen again. One consequence of that civil war was that Katata 11 was completely wiped out of wildlife. Cape buffalo were down to 1,200 in number. 
Sable were down to 44. People were starving. In came a man named Mark Haldane, South African, a professional hunter, an outfitter, a concessionaire. He took charge of Katata 11 in partnership with the government of Mozambique. 1,200 buffalo became 21,000. 44 sable became 1,400. In the last 10 years, he has invested $1 million of his revenue to restore wildlife in this area. He invests $100,000 a year in anti-poaching alone. Now, because of that anti-poaching work, which my organization helps support with training, advisory assistance, and procurement services, this is the only area in Mozambique that did not see a decline in elephant numbers during the last national elephant census. If that's not conservation, then I don't know what conservation looks like. But let's take a step back. Let's get a definition of conservation. The International Union for Conservation of Nature that I mentioned previously, that I serve, that Adams Organization is a part of, they define conservation as, and I'm going to read here because I want to make sure that we get this right. Conservation is the protection, care, management, and maintenance of ecosystems, habitats, species, and populations within or outside of their natural environments in order to safeguard the natural conditions for their long-term permanence. Because of this definition, a scientific consensus has emerged through the IUCN, the largest network of conservation scientists in the world. There is a consensus that hunters conserve wildlife. The IUCN just recently sent a briefing paper to the European Parliament that was influential in convincing that parliament not to adopt trade bans that would interfere with African hunting programs. Now, you'll always find scientists on the fringe who are willing to say that's not true, who are willing to buck the consensus. Climate change deniers do this all the time. But for those of us who care about wildlife, we should listen to the consensus that hunters are an indispensable part of the conservation ecosystem. And this isn't to say that we're the only part. We need bird watchers as much as we need duck hunters. This isn't an either or question. This is about a holistic, sustainable approach to wildlife conservation that Anthony, myself, and the people who Hope serves are grateful to be a part of because we want to pass down a rich natural heritage that's filled with elephants, sable, cape buffalo, wolves, grizzly bears, white-tailed deer. And for all the reasons I just said, you should vote in favor of the motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Jensen. And that's the motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife. And here is our first debater to, debater to speak against the motion. He is Wayne Pacelli, President and CEO of the Humane Society of the United States and author of the book, The Humane Economy. Walter Palmer used his wealth to travel halfway around the world uh, to shoot a magnificent lion, not for management, not for food, but to add another trophy to his home collection. In pursuit of more and more trophies, as we see so many members of the Safari Club International, this globe-trotting enterprise of killing the biggest and rarest animals in the world. Now, we were outraged as a nation, and so many people around the world were outraged about it. And part of that is explained by our growing sensitivity to animals. We're less tolerant of factory farming. We don't like dogfighting and cockfighting. We don't accept horse slaughter for human consumption. There are all sorts of abuses of animals that we once accepted, but now don't meet our moral tests in our society. So there's obviously a very big ethical debate about trophy killing or other forms of hunting, sport hunting, and commercial trapping. I think there are gradations in that world. I think Walter Palmer and the other trophy hunting uh, advocates who travel around the world to kill rare species are one category. 
than a guy in West Virginia or Pennsylvania who kills a deer to eat meat and fill the freezer is a whole other beast, if you will. And we're not going to really get into all the elements of that debate, because tonight we're talking about this motion that hunters conserve wildlife. And I want to prove to you tonight, with Adam, uh, that that is a really gross overstatement. It's really a bromide. It's something that's been repeated decade after decade, and there's very little evidence to support it at this time. You know, most hunters are going out into the woods for you know, their own reasons. Walter Palmer traveled to Zimbabwe to kill a lion because he wanted to kill a lion and get a trophy. Other people want to go out and be with their friends or family members. Some like to experience nature. Some may do it for meat purposes. But most people are not going out to kill these creatures because they support conservation. If you do that, you can give money to a land trust or you can support conservation in all sorts of ways, very tangible ways uh, to help creatures who are really facing so many pressures uh, from those of us, our, our species, that is crowding so many of these animals out. You know, when you think about the United States, two billion acres is the land mass of this country. 700 million acres is owned by the federal government. Just two or three percent of that land has been purchased as a consequence of hunting-oriented programs like duck stamps or the Federal Pittman-Robertson Act, which sets aside money. It's a tax on guns and ammunition. Actually, all gun owners and ammunition buyers, not just hunters. There are many more people who have guns in the world than have uh, an interest in hunting. So it's a tiny percentage of the land that has been preserved or saved from development. And when you think about the land trusts in this country, the Nature Conservancy, and hundreds and hundreds of other land trusts, almost none of them have a hunting orientation. They're out to save the land. They're out to protect wildlife because they just want it to be, not because they want to use these creatures and shoot them for recreation, for trophies, for other purposes. And you know, when we start to take a proper accounting, when we really think about conservation, when we think about protecting land, saving threatened and endangered species, preserving ecosystems. Let's think about some of the things that are the collateral effects of hunting. Hunters are one of the biggest sources of lead dispersed into the environment. Now we have copper shot, we have bismuth, we have steel. All of these forms of shot can be used by hunters. But we're putting millions of pounds of lead into the environment that's poisoning 15 to 20 million animals a year, loons and other species, also the highly endangered California condor. Why are we using lead when we have alternatives? If you're conservation-minded, you're not going to randomly poison millions of creatures. We have captive hunts that are tolerated by the NRA and the Safari Club International and other organizations in this field where exotic animals are stocked in fenced areas and shot for a fee. In, a, in an open-air slaughterhouse sort of arrangement. It's disguised hunting, but all of the national hunting groups support it, they defend it, they oppose our legislative efforts to stop it. And many of these exotic species that they're shooting in the United States have escaped and they're colonizing our habitats. That's the reason we have wild boars in so many parts of the country that are degrading landscapes and are considered a nuisance by federal land managers and state uh, wildlife managers. We have this safari club program globally. You want to get uh, the Africa Big Five Award? You shoot a lion, a leopard, a rhino, an elephant, and a Cape buffalo. You want to, shoot, you want to get the Cats of the World uh, Award? You shoot five of the big cats. I mean, these folks are going after some of the rarest animals in the world. Hunting is not, uh, and, and the, the idea of hunting is conservation, you know, it sounds like a wonderful slogan. But what are the details? What are the specific terms? Because they pay hunting license fees? Because they buy a duck stamp? Well, there's a tax on tobacco, and some of that money goes to the healthcare system. Does that make tobacco companies and smokers healthcare advocates? The oil companies are taxed under the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and some of that money goes to protect habitat. 
Do we think of the oil companies and the gas companies as leading wildlife and land protectors? No. It just happens to be that they're taxed because there are costs to the enterprise. And much of the money that is used you know, for those purposes goes to just maintain the hunting programs in a quasi-agricultural program to provide more deer and more game animals for hunters to shoot. When the reality is there are dozens and dozens of other species that desperately need our attention. So hunting is an ethical issue and it's declining in terms of its popularity, but the idea that hunting is conservation, that's not why anybody goes out into the woods when they want to kill an animal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne Caselli. And a reminder of what's going on, we are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan. We have four debaters, two teams of two, fighting it out over this motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife. You've heard from the first two debaters, and now on to the third, debating for the motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife, Anthony Licata. He is editor-in-chief of Field and Stream Magazine and editorial director of the men's group at the Bonnier Corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Licata. Thank you, thank you. Tonight, we're gonna to show you how hunting has, in fact, protected wildlife and habitat throughout North America through this wonderful North American model. I was really happy to hear Wayne ask for details because I, could have, I have some. And I would like everyone else's opinion about some of the numbers that he's poo-pooed to see if they really are all that small. And the fact is, Hunting provides a sustainable, repeatable model in which wildlife can be managed and protected. I want to give you some history first. At the turn of the 20th century, habitat loss and market hunting had had our species at the point of extinction. Bears, elk, moose, even white-tailed deer. Around this time, concerned hunters, including the editors of Field and Stream and New Yorker Theodore Roosevelt, pushed to set game laws, base wildlife management on science, and make it managed by the public. The principles that form this are called the North American Wildlife Model. It still drives much of what we do for a simple reason. It works. The system is not perfect, but there is no other form of wildlife management that has the results that this model has had. Hunting is at the center of this story. It's a tool for managing wildlife, but it also makes hunters a powerful tool and advocate for wildlife, supporters of wildlife. But let's talk about numbers, some of those pieces of land and some of those programs that Wayne mentioned. Hunters provide 80% of the funding to fish and game wildlife agencies. There's about 37 million hunters in the United States and every single one of them contributes. All told, sportsmen contribute a billion dollars a year to wildlife conservation. To me, that's not a small number. These funds come from a variety of ways. The first source of these funds are through hunting licenses. These monies go directly to the state that sold them, and these dollars can only be used for wildlife management and conservation. Big number, small number. Since 1965, they generated $22 billion. Just last year, in 2015, they generated $821 million. Wayne explained Pittman Robertson, and this is that excise tax on sales and ammunition. Something to know here is that this law was advocated for, lobbied, supported by hunters, voluntarily. It has generated more than 12 billion for state wildlife management and conservation. Of those funds, 62% are used to buy, develop, and maintain wildlife habitat. Since the act became law, the states have purchased about 4 million acres of wildlife habitat, and an additional 40 million acres are managed under agreements with private landowners. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service create, uh, credits Pittman Robertson with rebuilding these populations of these animals and extending the ranges from wild turkey, white-tailed deer, mule deer, elk, black bear, bobcat, mountain lions. For example, in 19, uh, 1910, there were 20,000 elk in Montana. Now there's 120,000, in large part thanks to these monies. Mule deer, all the other ungulates have had similar recoveries. What's that done? It's allowed 
wolves and mountain lions to make a recovery as well. Right now, money generated by Pittman Robertson is working to conserve wolves around the Great Lakes and run the wolf conservation program in Oregon. Non-game benefits as well. It's not just about hunters having more. Here in New York State, there's efforts in the Albany Pine Bush area to protect the endangered Carner Blue Butterfly. This is a butterfly so rare that even the loss of a few could be uh, devastating to the population. This program is receiving significant funds from Pittman Robertson, paid for by hunters. Truth is, most of the budgets for wildlife management, which takes place on some of those federal lands that Wayne mentioned, come from these fees. 80% of Wyoming's budget comes from that. In Michigan, it's 76, and Colorado, it's 70. A third component is the federal duck stamp. Again, this was, this was an idea made by hunters, lobbied by hunters, supported by hunters. It's generated $800 million in money for wetland conservation since its introduction, with 98 cents of every dollar going to purchase wetlands or acquire easements that feed into the national wildlife refuge system that we can all enjoy. The duck stamp has preserved 6.5 million acres of wetlands. Here in New York, it's 20,000 acres. I don't think that's so small. A fourth source of hunter-generated income comes from the many nonprofit hunter-run conservation groups. These groups are organizations like Ducks Unlimited, the Boone and Crop Club, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Pheasants Forever, many more. Let's look at Ducks Unlimited as just one example. The sportsman back group protects wetlands for ducks, but because hunters know that wildlife needs intact, functioning, healthy ecosystems to live, it also benefits insects, fish, salamanders, mink, marten, shrews, beavers, all the animals that depend on a healthy wet wetland. In 2014 and 2015 alone, DU raised $238 million that went to wildlife conservation. 85% of that money goes directly into waterfowl habitat restoration and acquiring lands. I don't think that's a small number. With the money it has raised, DU has conserved more than 13 and a half million acres of wetlands across North America. This doesn't take into account all the volunteer hours that hunters give working on grassroots conservation projects. What's important to note here is that these groups and all this money is all driven by people's love of hunting. They love the sports, they love the animals, they love the places. It's their desire to preserve these species, to preserve these places that drive all these efforts. When you consider these facts, this history, the billions, literally billions of dollars raised by Hunters for Conservation, the millions of acres preserved, the hundreds of species that have benefited, I think it's clear that hunting plays a very critical role and wildlife conservation. And that's why I hope that you will agree with me tonight and support this proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony Licata. And that proposition is hunters conserve wildlife. And here is our final debater. He will be speaking against the motion. That's Adam Roberts. He is CEO of Born Free USA and Born Free Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Roberts. Thank you very much, John. It's interesting being the fourth speaker because I have the benefit of hearing the 14 minutes of argumentation presented by the affirmative side of today's debate. And I think I'd like to start my comments the same way Anthony started. He said something very interesting about hunting. He called it a sustainable, repeatable model, which I think is a very interesting phrase. A sustainable, repeatable model, unless you're the bull elephant that's been killed, taken away from the family system and the ecosystem, depriving of the local community of ecotourism revenue for generation after generation. That doesn't seem to me to be sustainable. Thank you. And obviously we've heard a lot of different arguments in these 14 minutes and I try very hard to figure out how I can sum them all up in a simple way for you all in the time that I'm allotted. And I think the way I can best do that is with two words, two very simple words to describe the entire argument for the affirmative of today's debate. Trust us. 
That is what they're really telling you. Trust us that politically we have the wherewithal in countries around the world to ensure that hunting quotas are set by potentially corrupt governments sustainably to ensure that it's based on the sound scientific evidence and biology to ensure that no animal is ever overhunted. Trust us that laws setting bag limits and hunt seasons are always going to be followed to the letter by every hunter, Walter Palmer excluded. Trust us that economically, the revenue that's generated by every hunting license, every fee that's paid, $10,000, $20,000 to hunt a lion in Tanzania, is actually going to go back into local communities, back into conservation, on the ground where it matters most. Trust us. And trust us that as hunters, we are always going to be sportsmen and women who are ethical and do what is right by animals and never overhunt, never take too many. Trust us that the logic of these arguments hold the day. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what your vote was at the beginning of the debate, but at the end of the debate, if you can consider politically, legally, economically, reproductive biology and logic all dictate that hunters conserve wildlife, then yes, you have to vote in the affirmative. But I think what Wayne and I are showing today is that that is a folly. And we have to take a slightly global view when we look at these things, so let's look at them one at a time. Politically, we have a regime in Zimbabwe, a very pro-hunting nation, run by a dictator named Robert Mugabe, whose cronies are taking over land, former farmlands, turning them into hunting concessions. But those hunting concessions are not just for the lawful sportsmen, the Walter Palmer of the world. And by the way, we really have to stop talking about the separation between the lawful sportsman and the poacher, because I think he proved that the line all too often gets blurred. But in a place like Zimbabwe, those same hunting concessions where legal hunters are going with their permit to kill animals, you're having rhinos being poached for their horn, elephants being poached for their ivory, and those products being shipped off to Asia. In Tanzania, one of the bastions of hunting, a strongly pro-hunting nation, always saying how our neighbors in Kenya don't have hunting, and look what's happening to the wildlife there. In the Salu ecosystem alone, you have the absolute decimation of lions, the bastion of the country, because of overhunting. So politically, we can see that globally, there is no justification for the argument that hunters conserve wildlife. In fact, we see that politically, the deck is, the deck is stacked against animals. Legally, Conservation International has done a study in which they show that you have Vietnamese poachers going into South Africa, where each individual can only get one permit to hunt a rhino. And they're bringing in people to hunt rhinos with those permits, including prostitutes from Thailand, to take back the rhino horn because that's not commercial trade, that's a trophy. And they're taking that trophy back and it's finding its way into the black market. Legally, the deck is stacked against animals when we look at trophies. But economically is perhaps the most interesting argument of all, because that's the one we hear all too often, that the hunter pays for the privilege of the thrill kill. The hunter pays for the privilege of killing animals for sport, and therefore, there is an absolute nexus between that payment of money and what happens on the ground. Well, let's look at some facts. And again, this is globally. A new study by Crest out of Washington, D.C. looked at the Great Bear Rainforest in British Columbia and found that looking at ecotourism related to bears and other carnivores versus hunting, for ecotourism, you have 12 times more visitor spending than you do hunting, 11 times more direct revenue going to the government than you do from hunting, and in 2012, you had 510 jobs generated because of ecotourism and only 11 because of the hunting industry. Look at wolves in Yellowstone. $35 million generated through ecotourism, more than four times as much as hunting in the same area. And lastly, I would leave you with three numbers. Just remember these three numbers. 0.27%, 1.8%, 3%-ish. Looking at nations in Africa that both have both ecotourism and hunting, and hunting, the type of big five hunting that Wayne discussed, in no nation that has that condition is more than 0.27, about a quarter percent of the GDP generated from hunting revenue. Of all the tourism revenue combined, only 1.8% is generated from hunting. Now, I'm no mathematician, but that says to me that more than 98% is generated by ecotourism, a drastically different sum. And when Catherine talks about needing to think about the people on the ground in Africa, I say if you really want to help the people on the ground in Africa, you help them with sustainable ecotourism models, not hunting models. And lastly, 3%. 
The UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the hunting industry itself has noted that only 3% of hunting revenue actually makes it back to the local communities. The rest of it is held in government coffers and foreign operators. Remember, it's not the people on the ground in Tanzania or Zambia that are running these ecotourism, opera these uh, hunting operations, it's foreign operations. And then biology. We know that in 1980, there were estimated to be 78,500 lions left in Africa. Today, there are fewer than 20,000. And this is a species that for those same three decades were hunted. American trophy hunters taking more than 500 lions on average year after year after year. I encourage you, since we've already talked about the IUCN, to go back and on your computer, look up the IUCN red list, and look at all the species that are listed as critically endangered, endangered, threatened, near threatened, and see how many of them have as one of the factors threatening those species' survival over hunting. What we see time after time after time is that politically, legally, economically, biologically, and logically, the argument fails. Hunters overall globally do not conserve wildlife, and if we really care about both people and wildlife, we do need to generate sustainable models for the long term, and that's keeping animals alive, not dead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam Roberts. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our motion is hunters conserve wildlife. And now we move on to round two. In round two, the debaters address one another directly, and they also take questions from me and from you in our live audience. Our motion is hunters conserve wildlife. The team arguing for the motion, Catherine Semser and Anthony Licata, have argued that their proposition is backed by a scientific consensus, that in fact hunters do conserve wildlife. They look at the history, early 20th century, a time when many animal populations in the United States were on the threat of extinction and because, they say, of hunter-generated initiatives and laws and financing, many, many species, moose, elk, bear, beaver, wild turkey made a comeback. They say that that is still the system today that is superior to any other. They also argue that it works in Africa. And speaking of Africa, they talk about the fact that ecotourism is not sufficient to raise the funds to preserve wildlife. Hunters will go places, they say, that photo tourists never will. The team arguing against the motion, Wayne Pacelli and Adam Roberts, um, talk about this proposition, hunters conserve wildlife as a gross overstatement and a folly. They doubt the motives of hunters who claim to be conserving wildlife as their reason for going out there. They say hunters are killing for many, many other reasons and that a minority at most have the concerns, the, the welfare of wildlife in mind. They say that the deck, the deck is stacked against animals legally, economically, logically, and in many other ways, but they argue that ecotourism is a valid and viable solution for preserving wildlife, conserving wildlife, um, and that hunting just makes no sense uh, in, in any way for them. I want to go to the team arguing against the motion. Your opponents who are arguing that hunters conserve wildlife, as I just mentioned, they make this historical argument that back in the early 20th century, there were in this country, the United States, a number of species who were severely threatened by um, essentially commercial, commercial hunting at that time and that it was the Teddy Roosevelt's and the Boone and Crockett Club and those organizations that fought to preserve laws. Perhaps, as you say, their motives were that they wanted to kill more animals, they wanted those animals to be there, that nevertheless, they succeeded in bringing those populations back. What's your response to that, Wayne Pacelli? Well, there's no question that there were robust efforts by sportsmen to stop the era of market hunting and the slaughter of animals. That's a matter of historical record. They weren't the only ones who advocated for it. But the problem with that thinking is that they're having to go back to 1900 to support their argument today. You know, what Teddy Roosevelt did in 1890 or what Aldo Leopold did in 1920, it is a very interesting historical perspective, but we're talking about an active debate today. Uh, we're talking about so many species on the cusp of extinction. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of species. When I'm in Congress and we're arguing for land protection, when we're advocating for the Endangered Species Act, I can assure you that the NRA is not by our side, nor is the Safari Club, nor is the U.S. Sportsman's Alliance. They're typically on the other side. The big debates that we have in the United States over legitimate conservation, protecting public lands, preserving endangered species, maintaining healthy ecosystems with the full range of species in it, these guys are on the other side. They are anti-conservationists. There are no big debates in the Congress 
that you can really describe as central to environmental and ecological protection where the professional hunting lobbyists are, are with us. They're against us on all these issues. Let's so take, so, me, so just, to, just to close, though, it's great to talk about Teddy Roosevelt, but what about now? Okay, what about now, Adam Licata? Your, your opponent just said that the, the argument you made is essentially out of date. What about now, right now? In Adam, can you just come a little bit yes, closer absolutely. to your mic? Thanks. Absolutely. As I mentioned, right now, monies raised by hunters are working to on the wolf conservation programs in Oregon. That's happening right now. Every year, 80% of the wild, state wildlife managers, which they are the ones on the ground, the biologists who have to improve habitat and manage our wildlife populations, 80% of those funds come from hunters. That's happening right now. Every year, hunters contribute $1 billion through those figures and facts and, and um, different ways that I mentioned. That's happening right now. It's an ongoing process. Ducks Unlimited, they, the, the numbers I cited are, happened last year. The truth is, populations are up. They absolutely are, but because we work at it. It's not stable. It's something that always needs work, especially as the okay. land is being developed. Uh, we always need to protect healthy habitat for wildlife, and that is what hunters always advocate for. Okay, so Adam, uh, Adam Robbins, your opponent, is saying that it's the, 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 the dynamic they're talking about is not out of date, that in fact hunters are still they, they're, they're talking about the money they pony up, billion dollars a year. Uh, their argument also uh, talked about, uh, again, uh, wolf restoration, um, acreage that's being set aside. So it does, they are saying there's a lot going on now, that their model is very effective now. What's your response to that? Well, I think it's very effective if you look at it in a very small microcosm. It's not sustainable, and, and I like history, so let's go back 100 years, right? So in the 1880s, you had 11,000 black bears in Florida, but they were literally hunted to the brink of extinction over the next century to the point where there were only a few hundred of them left. So what happened after hunters put this onslaught against the species? Hunting was banned in 1994 in Florida. The species was protected. What happened when the protection came into effect? The species started to rebound to the point where a decade later you had more than 3,000 animals. The only problem is when you have this kind of rebound, the hunting community, because they are so focused on wanting the kill, reopen the hunt. They pushed to have the Game Commission reopen the hunt. They sold more licenses, 3,778 of them, than there were estimated black bear population in the state. And the, and the hunting season had to be closed after two days because the quota was filled. So the problem is this concept is yo-yo conservation. We want wolves to recover in the Great Lakes region only so that we can hunt them back again. Bears to recover in Florida only so we can hunt them back again. again, back again. Right. It's is, not a sustainable is model. That a, is that a fair assessment? Of, of the position, Catherine Samser, would you say? I, I think absolutely not, and I think you're being really disingenuous, Adam. I mean, you're obfuscating market hunting, people killing predators because they're competing with livestock, with sportsmen, and you know and I know that they are not the same thing. Can you elucidate that a little bit for, for the audience that's not yeah. quite up to speed on what you're talking about? So what is what is? I'm it? sorry, I couldn't hear you over the applause. Uh, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> you enjoyed that moment, huh? Um, can you elucidate a little bit about what you're talking about? For the, you, you use some terms of art, and we'd like to know what you mean by that. Sure. Sportsmen are people like Anthony and myself, sportswomen. Um, we are the people who hunt legally. We pay into the system. We purchase licenses. We do boots-on-the-ground conservation projects. The cause of lion decline is not sportsmen, and you know this. The cause of lion decline is herdsmen killing lions because they are competing with their livestock. That is in every single document from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to the IUCN. But, but, no, uh, Wayne, let me finish. Do not interrupt me. Well, ahead, let please. me just say, let me, wait a minute, That's wait a minute. That's John's job. No, no, but a little, a little pushback interruption is okay and is not to be taken as offensive. Uh, and I'll sort it out when it happens. So, I want to hear, hear what he has to say, and then, then you sure, come back to it. it. But I, I, don't, I don't want there to be, this to be so incredibly civil that I have to <laughs> tell people when they speak. So you can push a little bit. If it gets out of hand, I'll pull it back I'm in. I'm glad Wayne jumped in first. Wow. <laughs> okay, so, so let me just say, you know, this wolf thing is, I mean, I, I'm a little bit astonished at Anthony's argument. Wherever wolves are in the United States, and there are only 5,000 or so in the lower 48, the commercial trappers and the trophy hunters are after them. 
Uh, we shut down, we shut down the, the wolf trophy hunting program in the Great Lakes region under federal court. The courts ruled that the delisting of the animals was unwarranted. They are still threatened or endangered. No one is hunting these animals for conservation. But, but, no, one, know, but, but no one's but, hunting them for food. They're killing, they're killing, John, they're but killing. But you're talking about motive as opposed to effect. And, right, and, 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 and your, your opponent just came up with a really interesting argument that, that in Africa, the, lion, the collapse of the lion population is not the result of hunters killing some lions, but that it's actually the interaction of lions with the, with the, local, yeah, and that's with the local culture. And our, I'd like to, a response to that. Our view is that, that view is invalidated by the fact that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service just listed them as threatened or endangered. And when they wrote the rulemaking, they said that trophy hunting was one of the causative mm -hmm. factors in the decline. Now, there are multiple explanations for the decline of lions. Certainly, herdsmen, habitat loss, but when you're killing, Adam said it was 500 a year, the, the last year that it happened was 720 lions out of 20,000 that are surviving. How is that not going to have an effect? I let, mean, that, I, let that question stand and be answered by your opponents. It's a great question. How is that not well, going to have an effect, well, uh, well, Anthony just to, talk, to get back to wolves for a minute. Um, <laughs> Wolves are reintroducing wait, the great... Wait, I want to answer that question, oh, then we'll come sorry. back to those. You both want to talk wolves, but I want to... How, how, how is killing 720 lions out of 20,000 not going to have an effect on the population, is the question. I think it's really and, simple. And, and can you come a little closer to your mic? Yeah, too, sorry. Too, thanks. What the Fish and Wildlife Service has also found is that there are instances in which hunting can benefit lion populations. And it's because we tend to get obsessed on the 1%, the Cecil. We really need, from a conservation focus, to be focused on the 99%. The money raised by killing one old male lion, who's probably starting to prey on cattle, possibly starting to prey on people, because he's no longer able to catch the gazelle. That money then gets funneled back into protecting the 99% of the lion population. Conservation and, and is, is a resource. Is that, the, is that the lion that would be targeted? That is the lion that okay. is generally targeted because these professional hunters, these guys, these outfitters, they live with these animals. They live in these communities. They talk to the tribal chief who says, that one's a problem over there. Okay. That lion, if not killed by a hunter who's willing to pay money into the conservation system, will be killed by the local villagers. Okay, let's, let's take that scenario to your opponents, and we're, we'll stay on lions for a little bit longer, then we'll move on to wolves. Well, if I have to talk about lions, I shall. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, so, so listen, so here's the way it goes with the lions, right? We know for certain how many lion trophies are being imported into America. We also know for certain, based on the permitting, how many are going into the EU. It is undeniable that there is a negative conservation impact by trophy hunters on the lion population, and that's what we're here to discuss. Not whether there are Why other Why is it factors. undeniable? I mean, it sounds like you're begging the question. You're, you're making that assertion. Why is that undeniable? Well, because we can see the decline over the past 35 years when there has been trophy hunting for the species. Direct, that is not to say... A direct correlation A direct time. correlation. Now, that's not to say, to Catherine's point, that there aren't other factors, but I would challenge her seriously to tell me how many retaliatory killings by livestock owners happen every year. We have no clue how often that happens. So we're not saying that trophy hunting is the only negative impact on lions, but if we're here to decide whether hunters conserve wildlife and there is hunting of lions in Africa and there is this incredible perilous decline of the species toward extinction, the answer has to be no. Hunters are not conserving lions in Africa. If they were, these other factors would potentially be mitigated by the money that's generated by the trophy hunts, has, which for lions can be $70,000. Now, if you ask Craig Packer, the eminent lion biologist, what it would take to actually make a measurable impact, he says, not 50,000, not 70,000. Every lion hunt needs to cost $1 million if you want to have an impact. Um, would you like to respond, Anthony, or do you want to stay with it? Catherine? I think you could put that up at auction at any number of the sportsmen's conventions and people would pay it. So, but you are essentially saying that, that the profit, in the terms of trophy hunting, the profit motive is, is essential to, to the whole system working. Conservation does not come for free. It is a very capital intensive effort. You know, something we talked a little bit about photo tourism and, and ecotourism, and that's great. We need that too. But the reality is in Africa, it's not possible everywhere. Can we hold that? Because I do yeah. want to, I do want to explore your opponent's argument that there are other ways to, for people who are 
sincere about conservation to contribute to conservation other than hunting. I want to get to that, but we both, both you, your sides wanted to talk about wolves. And Wayne, I cut you off, so well, you go and we're going to bring it back I, then too. Th thank you. I did want to say just about the, the lions that, um, <laughs> while we're on the subject, All right. you know, Bo Botswana just outlawed trophy hunting. There are more lions in Botswana than any other country in Africa. Uh, they outlawed all trophy hunting of these animals. And the wildlife authorities there say we can make much more money by keeping the living capital there. You can watch a lion 100 times. You can watch a lion 500 times. You can monetize that each time, aggregating more dollars for the economy, for rural communities, for the government. You can shoot the animal only once. Okay. The arithmetic so is so plain to me. We're going to now go into the ecotourism. We'll come back to wolves later because you're, you're, <laughs> you're now into the topic. When you're talking about watching lions, you're talking about drawing tourists to come see animals, uh, photo safaris, et cetera. Your opponents are very skeptical that there's enough money in that to, to come up with the kinds of funding that would come close to what hunters are coming up with. So go ahead more with that, Wayne, and we it, let your opponents respond. The, the numbers are, are undeniable. I mean, how many people are interested in trophy hunting? A few tens of thousands, they're the ones who are aging. They're the declining numbers, not those old lions. And how many, mil how many millions of us glory in seeing elephants and lions? and consider it the experience of a lifetime to see them and to take a picture of them. That's fine, leave them there. We want them to stay alive because they're wonderful creatures. So just look at the, the underlying numbers. If you have people paying for wildlife watching concessions and you have millions doing it, and then you have just a few thousand people who want to shoot these animals and, and, and run away with their, their heads and their hides, I mean, it's so clear. Look at the numbers. Adam quoted many of the numbers. The trophy hunting concessions in Africa are minuscule compared to wildlife watching, which is why Botswana and Kenya and Rwanda have banned all trophy hunting. Let's take it to um, Catherine. Or Adam, would you like to? Adam, we haven't heard from you in a couple of minutes, and I want to give you a chance to jump in if you'd like to respond, or I'll pass it to Catherine since. Are we back to wolves? Or are we talking about? No, we're, we're going to we're going to talk about this this notion of whether there's whether ecotourism can can take up the slack if, if hunting were to be banned completely? I, I don't think it can, And first of all, but it doesn't have to be an either-or thing, especially when you're talking... But, but your opponents want it to be an either-or thing. That's why I'm bringing yeah. it to you. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't need to be an... It shouldn't be an either-or thing, especially when you're talking about uh, North America. When you're talking about North America, where um, the wildlife populations are high and sustainable, and by the way, it's not trust us, it's not trust hunters, we don't set them. I don't think you should trust any, anybody, I think, except the biologists and the professionals who study and, and develop the populations. When those populations are healthy and stable, there is plenty for hunting, wild, wildlife watching, all kinds of activity. The problem really is habitat. It's not, um, if certain animals are hunted, you're not gonna see them in all in North America. Anybody have any trouble seeing white-tailed deer or wild turkey around when you get out of the city? That's not the case at all. You could do both. What causes problems is habitat loss. And what about in the African scenario, Catherine? I mean, I agree with, with Wayne and, and Adam. The numbers are undeniable. You know, there was a study released by the World Wildlife Fund last year that showed that 74% of the wildlife conservancies in Namibia, including the ones that incorporated phototourism into their conservation programs, 74% would not be economically viable if they were to take the trophy hunting revenue out of their program. Wait. No. Okay, go ahead. Um, <laughs> in, the, in this case, I'm on her pausing. side. I thought you were pausing. Yeah. No, I think she's, uh, that was a comma. Okay. We also have to look at where the money goes to. You know, in Tanzania, the wildlife division receives almost nine times as much funding from hunting than it does from phototourism. In Zimbabwe, their why, wildlife... Why, why is that? I mean, what's, what are the facts on the ground that dictate that? Um, because of the way that their laws are structured. Um, now, that's not to say that maybe those laws shouldn't change, but that's up to the people of Tanzania. It's not up to Adam. It's not up to Wayne. It's not up to me. It's not up to anyone in this room. It's up to the people of Tanzania. In Zimbabwe, between 60 and 90% of the revenue that their wildlife division depends on comes from hunting. Well, the, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife I'm just Service. Gonna, one more point, and then I'll, I'll let you speak. Um, no, no, I'll let him speak. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I'll just close by saying, you know, the United Nations um, World Tourism Organization released a study last year, and what they found was 50% of the photo tourist operations do not contribute a single penny to anti-poaching operations. Okay, I'm not that is abysmal. Yeah, I'm not only going to let you speak. I, I gave them two speaking turns in a row, so you have two speaking okay, turns in a thank row. Thank you. So, so Catherine keeps invoking Zimbabwe, which is run by a horrible dictator named Robert Mugabe. Uh, it's a corrupt country. They're selling wildlife off to wh whomever wants to buy it. And the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, the leading wildlife authority in the United States, banned elephant trophy imports into the United States for a reason, for conservation-minded reasons. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has placed the lion on the threatened and endangered list for conservation reasons. I don't know why we keep going back to Zimbabwe here, but I would like to turn the question back to, to Catherine or Anthony. If, if one of your enthusiasts within the world of trophy hunting wanted to trophy hunt a whale, you know, if they wanted to, to shoot a whale because they were rare, because they were big, because they were beautiful, would that be, would that be acceptable if they paid a million dollars for it? Maybe some of that money would go back to protect a tiny little piece of ocean space. Would it be okay to kill a whale? As far as I know, biologists have determined that whales cannot be hunted, and it's not a legal hunting um, activity. It is not something that uh, our audience is interested in doing. It's not something you can do if you follow the biology and the science. It's, legal hunting is about following the parameters that professional wildlife biologists set and working as to be part of that ecosystem. Well, you're, you're, you're and I also think that this is something really important, let me just say. Hmm. Uh, I think something that's been missing from this debate is the fact that hunters, people, human hunters, are natural predators of many game animals. We've always been. Hunters have evolved, humans have evolved as hunters, and the animals have evolved with us. Hunting animals is part of a long, acceptable part of the ecosystem of the natural circle of life. And as long as it's done in a way that is respectful, that benefits not one animal of that species, but the entire species, as a way that lifts up the entire ecosystem, as a way that's done holistic, and to make the world and the habitat stronger and better and improve habitats, I think that's a perfectly acceptable thing. Okay. Um you two still have a double turn coming, which you, you gave away, Wayne, by asking yeah. a question. The other <laughs> but side. I'm not going to hunt a whale. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, so let, let me Roberts. say two things. One is, uh, and two things about Anthony's answer, which I find really interesting. So there would be someone who would pay to hunt a blue whale, to hunt a fin whale. There would be someone who would pay for that privilege. But it's not in the best interest of the conservation of whales, which have been depleted by overhunting for centuries, to have that happen. And that's what Anthony just admitted. It's been decided by the right biologists in the right place that that's not good for conservation. Much like the U.S. Department of the Interior has determined it's not in the best conservation interest of the African lion to continue to have unfettered killing by American trophy hunters. Hunters are not contributing to the conservation of the lion. I think Wayne made an excellent point about the elephant imports, and we keep talking again about Tanzania and, and Zimbabwe. It's remarkable that we are. In Tanzania and Zimbabwe, those are the two countries that the Department of the Interior said you cannot bring in trophies from an elephant kill because there is no sound management in those two countries to ensure the long-term viability of those species. So what we see time after time after time is the negative conservation impact of hunting, whether it's lions or elephants or any number of other species, and the need for the government agencies filled with these smart biologists to do something about it. What Wayne and I say is, why wait until it's too late? Why wait until wolves are depleted and bears are depleted and lions and elephants are depleted? Let's take a precautionary approach and ensure that hunters do not contribute to the decline of these species, rather than have this yo-yo conservation where we allow them to recover and then hunt them back to the verge of okay. extinction once you again. You mentioned yeah. wolves. Yeah, and, thank uh, you. Yeah. You know, Wayne you know uh, it was animal protection groups and conservation groups that fought to list the wolf as endangered after they were persecuted for decades. And now wherever wolves have kind of snuck back and their numbers are in the hundreds or in the low thousands, 
The trophy hunting community and the trapping community wants to kill them. And why? Of course they want the trophies, but also they view the wolves as competitors. When wolves eat deer, some hunters think that is one hunting license lost to the state or one hunting opportunity lost to the state. In Alaska, they do aerial gunning of wolves. You know, we, we have commercial trapping of wolves, trophy hunting. Again, nobody eats these animals. The only reason it's done is for ego and for trophies. No other purpose for it. And the numbers, while terrible for those wolves, the number of licenses and the total amount of dollars generated by that hunting is absolutely minimal for conservation. There's no possible contribution to any meaningful conservation program. And we have wildlife scientists after wildlife scientists telling us about the, in, the very important salutary effect of wolves within ecosystem in maintaining deer populations and beaver populations and maintaining the ecological balance of these ecosystems. Why would we be killing the top predators who are inedible? Let's let Anthony Licata respond. <laughs> Anthony, hang on just one second. After Anthony, I'm going to go to questions and answers from you and our audience. I just want to say the way it will work is you raise your hand. I call on you. A microphone will be brought to you. Please wait for the microphone. We'd like you to stand up, tell us your name, ask a very, very short question, and get them debating even more deeply on the topic. Go ahead, Anthony Licata. Sure. A couple things I'd like to clear up first. Uh, the commercial um, trapping of wolves and shooting wolves from uh, planes, we're not talking about commercial activities here. That's not what we're here to discuss. We're talking about rel uh, regulated sport hunting. That's what we're talking about, not commercial activities. And when you're talking about wolves, again, the funds from hunters were instrumental in reducing the wolves to the greater yellow eco Yellowstone ecosystem. And since wolves have been listed and they've been hunted, the numbers have continued to go up. The wolf numbers have not gone down. I, I'm in agreement with Adam. No one, no hunter wants numbers that come up and then they crash again and, and wipe them all out. That's not, that, that's not what's wiped these animals out in the first place. It was unregulated market hunting, commercial hunting, loss of habitat. We want the numbers to continue to grow. The numbers of wolves have continued to grow in the Yellowstone ecosystem despite being hunted. They've expanded their range. They're in Idaho, Utah, Washington, Oregon. The important point here is that Hunters are, are the ones helping manage those populations. And what is holding, why do they, the biologists want to limit the wolf populations? It's not hunters, it's other activities, it's other people. It's ranchers, frankly. Ranchers will only tolerate so many wolves because they eat livestock. And so the state has decided that that's what they have to do. And so they hire commercial shooters to trap those wolves, shoot those wolves, the states. I would love wolves to expand their range, but the truth is, we don't live in a country that was like it was 100 years ago. There's not going to be wolves here in New York as much as many of us would maybe want them. It's not going to happen. People won't support it. Um, livestock won't support it. Farmers won't support it. It won't happen. And the habitat is not there. Okay. It's too fragmented. All right, let's go to some audience questions, please. Again, if you raise your hand right down in front, sir. Mike's going to come down on your right-hand side. If you could stand up and tell us your name. <laughs> a question that takes under 30 seconds and the clock uh, starts now. My name now. is Brian Gaysford. I'm very involved with lion conservation for the last 15 years. I take very, I got kind of upset when I heard you say what, that once at Cecil, the old lion, <clears throat> I knew that lion. That lion brought in millions of dollars into Zimbabwe for... Sir, I need you to ask a question. Well... <laughs> not, not debate them, but ask a question that gets them to debate. Well, how come you think that that, that that line was over over the hill when he was bringing in so much money for conservation? And I'd like to also... Okay, no, that's a good question. Let's take it to, uh, to Catherine Semser. Because as a conservationist, given the state that we are in right now, I can't focus on one lion. I have to focus on the whole population. And we can invest tons of energy and resources into Morning Cecil. That's not going to bring him back, and it's not going to do anything to conserve the lions of Southern Africa. Sir, 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 um, if you're going to do that, at least hold the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want, to hear, I want to hear what your pushback was, but we couldn't hear you. I, I, but just make it brief. 
Because yeah, I think you might know what you're talking about. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just like. I'd just like to advise you that if the, if the hunters were so concerned about lion conservation, there were 13 other lions killed illegally that, that were wearing collars in Wangi National Park, and the social media never picked up on that. But, but, the, but this team is not, not arguing hunting. for illegal killing of animals. That's poaching. Yeah, that's, that's poaching. The, yeah, they're, they're not at all justifying that. Okay, thanks very and, much. And if I could just... I, I wanted, yeah, I wanted, I could go, just go ahead, and then I'm going to let your opponents have a shot at that. You too. know, I really and, think and something that... something I would... Oh, I'm oh, going to let her finish no, and come back Wingo. You want Wayne to go no. first, okay. and then, but then let me go. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm, I'm always amused by this argument. You know, whenever you do something to hurt an animal, you try to attach some sort of social benefit or you try to rationalize it. The fact that these are old animals, I mean, this is crazy. Who's out there aging the animals and who's assessing? And what's a post-reproductive lion anyway? I mean, they're able to, to have reproductive activities until a, a ripe, healthy old age. None of the researchers thought that this was a post-reproductive uh, animal that Walter Palmer shot. And the fact is, the people are doing it as a headhunting exercise. Okay, you've made that point. I want to let Catherine respond to the, to the, to the main point. I, I have a two-pronged... Can you come closer to you, Yeah, mic? I have a two-pronged response to the question of who's out there doing it. If we look at the wildlife agencies of African nations, if we look at the wildlife agencies of all of the states in the United States, if we look at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all agencies that support hunting and recognize its value to conservation, these agencies are the world's greatest brain trust of wildlife biologists. They have more wildlife biologists on staff than Adam's group, than Wayne's group, than my group, than work at Field and Stream. These people know what they're doing, and we're not saying trust us. We're saying trust them. The other point I wanted to make about Cecil is what didn't get caught up in the media, and particularly the social media, was that Cecil was part of a study that was funded by hunters. The research study that Cecil was part of was funded in part by Dallas Safari Club, which is a conservation organization based out of Texas whose membership is primarily hunters. Thank you. Another question? Ma'am, uh, right there. Thanks. Joyce Friedman, I'd like to know very literally, how, the word conserve means save. How is killing a living being or population members of, members of that population saving them? Seems pretty basic. How is killing saving? Sure. Adam, uh, I, I'm I sorry, think, uh, you, I think you answered it in your question. It's about the population. It's not about the individual animal. That's what conservation is, is to build up a healthy, balanced ecosystem full of biological diversity and plants. And one animal will not change that. The fact is, animals die all the time. We die all the time. There's natural predator and prey cycles. What matters is the overall biological health and the sustaining of the levels of the population. If the population goes down, you're right. That's not conserving it. The goal is for the population to go up. Adam Roberts. Well, with due respect, that's completely wrong. One animal, <laughs> one, one, animal, one animal does make a difference. That animal makes a difference to the family system. That animal makes a difference to the ecosystem. In the case, thank you. In the case, in the case of lions, we talk about post-reproductive males. Are these animals over six years old? The bottom line is the one word that they haven't used is infanticide. When you kill the male of the pride, another male comes in, and that male will kill the infants in order to stake his territory. That is doing damage to the entire population, not just the one animal that the trophy hunter took. That is a danger to the family system. And, and second of all, with the ecosystem, let's not forget my, my friend and conservationist Ian Redman talks about gorillas and elephants as the architects of the forest because they engage in seed dispersal. And without them, the ecosystem is damaged. So when the trophy hunter kills the elephant, there is an impact on the ecosystem. Every time we kill an animal, there is a threat, not just to that individual, but to the family system and the ecosystem as well. Let me let... Um it's a, very, it's a very cogent point. I want to hear how your opponents respond to it, particularly the, the notion that if you kill a, a male lion, that another male is going to come in and kill the cubs, and therefore you've destroyed a family, that, that there's, a, there's a very, very profound ripple effect. Is, does, do, do, you, do you concede that point? Or? It certainly does happen. But again, we need to listen to the scientists. You know, we are listening to the greatest brain trust of wildlife biologists on the planet. 
they have concluded that yes, that will happen. And maybe that is a moral issue and that is an ethical issue. And we can debate that in another forum. But what those scientists have determined is, is that is not a conservation issue. Well, let me take it, it to is not your, something that let affects me take the it to your opponents. Population. That is not a conservation. It's a moral and ethical issue. But then in the, in the larger picture of conservation, that it's not a, it's not a determinant factor. Well, I Point think that you know, I, I would reject the notion that we have only one metric in assessing these issues in general. Conservation is about protecting no, species. Our motion is. I understand. It's not ethical. I, yeah, yeah, I understand. But I think she made. She said that this may be a moral issue, but as a conservation right. issue, when you, when you deplete the population, you take out one animal from a small population, and then you have the ripple effect of the social consequences of another animal coming in, of course it has a conservation effect. Mm -hmm. But th this whole notion that somehow they're relying on the scientists, the Fish and Wildlife Service stopped what they're doing. So I don't understand this reliance on those scientists when we're talking about lions, and we're talking about elephants in Zimbabwe, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said, don't do it. But let me just say on the whole science issue, you know, the tobacco industry had scientists who defended smoking. I mean, I love, I love, I love you know, as Donald Trump says, I love scientists. But <laughs> <laughs> the fact is you can have great scientists and you can have not so great scientists. You can have, you can have captured scientists and you can have independent scientists. And I think that those people who work for the industry that are kind of that mindset of trophy hunting, uh, they're going to defend that. But lots of independent scientists say quite the contrary, that there is a collateral adverse your, effect. Your opponent has said it in her very opening statements that the broad scientific consensus is actually on their side. Yes, you can cherry pick, as in global, global warming debate, you can cherry pick people to fight the consensus. I think they're more or less saying that that's what you're doing, but that they have they have more scientists than you they, have. They don't, because we're, if we're talking about elephants and, and we're talking about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service stopped trophy imports from Tanzania and Zimbabwe recently, the two countries that we're talking about. They're stopping just about all of the lion killing. Those are the scientists. Who are the other scientists you're talking about? Those are the people. And, and can I just add to that quickly? Sure, you, very you know, quickly. I'm no scientist, so when I bring up these issues, it's based on the science that I've been informed of, and it's the scientists like Craig Packer, who's an eminent lion biologist, who talk about infanticide and lion prides. That's not a moral issue for me, though it's grotesque. It's a scientist, scientific okay. and conservation issue. Let me let Catherine respond. I mean, and, and in our debates, it often comes up that one side has science and the other side has science, and we sort of can't get anywhere because we don't have the scientists here. To, but, but I do want to take one more round of, of Catherine responding to your opponents, basically saying that the scientists have switched their position on this. Not on the broad question mm -hmm. of do hunters conserve wildlife. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature just sent a briefing paper to the European Parliament listing how hunters conserve wildlife, and we've covered a lot of these topics here tonight. The IUCN is the largest network on the planet of independent conservation scientists. They agree with Anthony and I. Now scientists might disagree on very specific things, whether to hunt lions or not to hunt lions. On the elephant question, I think it's important to note that the Fish and Wildlife Service is actually waiting for a report from Zimbabwe. And if they like what's in that report, they may reopen the importation of elephant trophies. As far as the lions go, there's a debate right now within the agency about what's called enhancement per, uh, permits. If range nations, who are the stewards of these lions, not us, but the range nations in Africa, if the range nations in Africa can show that the hunting of lions will help the overall population, the Fish and Wildlife Service may very well let some of those imports in. We have a question from Twitter uh, that's just been shared with me. And the question is, are there non-lethal ways to control wildlife population? Well, so uh, we're not asking broadly, are there non-lethal ways to conserve, but are there non-lethal ways to keep a population from getting too large? Well, ecosystems are self-sustaining. I mean, there are natural decimating factors that limit the growth of populations. I mean, there are density-dependent species where, you know, lack of access to food or space or mates. Look at national parks in the United States. Every national park in the U.S., with the exception of one, forbids trophy hunting and forbids sport hunting entirely. So we're managing those populations through Mother Nature, who does it quite well and has done so for eons. And 
If you, if you look at the range of national parks, from Acadia in Maine to Everglades in Florida to Yellowstone to Yosemite, and hundreds of units of the NPS, all of the national parks are not hunted. That should tell us all we need to know about the maintenance of the systems. Now, there may be issues with deer locally in, in middle Atlantic states where there's not a lot of winter kill, but that's not a conservation issue. That is an entirely different issue about whether you can sustainably hunt those animals year after year. But if we're talking about conservation and protecting rare species and maintaining the integrity of ecosystems, that's a different question. All right, and let me just take the question to the other side. Are there non-lethal ways to control populations? Uh, there, there's been no proven way for um, humans, a non-lethal way to control populations. That's cost effective, birth control, contraceptives, that sort of thing. Uh, we don't live in a one giant national park. Um, not everything has that intact ecosystem. The fact is there's a lot of people in this world and it's growing every day. This habitat is cut up by roads. The habitat won't support predators. It cannot just be left to its own. It absolutely cannot. So hunters have always been a part of that. We are a natural predator. We are a natural part of that ecosystem and always have been for the history of both humans and animals. And when it's done in the right way, it's an absolutely effective and valid way to I want to remind wildlife. I want to remind you that we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan, your moderator. We have four debaters, two teams of two, debating this motion, Hunters Conserve wildlife. Right down in the front here, the white jacket, fourth row. Hi. Could, thanks. Kate Novak from the Southern Tanzania Elephant Program. I'm wondering why the hunting sector has resisted independent auditing, trophy inspections, and conservation certification such as that uh, suggested by scientists like Craig Packer, which would obviously improve your transparency. Thank you. Catherine? I, I assume that question was directed at me. I think it was, no. yeah. Um, I don't represent the hunting sector. I don't represent the hunting industry, and I don't represent the hunting sector in Tanzania. I think that would be a better question to ask them about why they're resisting it. I can say at the IUCN, um, there has been increased discussion about the need for transparency within hunting programs, and personally, it's something that I would support. Okay. Right in the center there? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I, I meant somebody else, but you go ahead, sir, and well, I'll give you turn, your turn next, but if you could stand up, please. Larry Hahn. Uh, Larry, could you stand up? Thanks. You've mentioned twice that uh, we are natural uh, predators of animals through the ages. Uh, but through the ages, haven't we killed animals for food and uh, self-protection? And now, isn't it predominantly only for sport? No, it's much more complicated than that. There's, there's a lot of reasons to hunt. You know, sport, sport is one of them, but I kill animals for food, and I, the majority of American hunters do. Every state and province in the United States and Canada has rules about harvesting the meat and you're making use of the meat. Many times you have to pack out the meat before you even pack out a cape or horn if you're in a, a wilderness area. Um, to me, I, I'm a locavore. I like to know where my food comes from. Um, I like to know that my meat is organic, that it's been free range, that it's lived a humane life. And for me, there's no better way to know that through hunting. Um, I'm very proud when I feed my family that meat. That's why I grow a garden. I can go to the green market, sure, I can go to the grocery store, but that connects me to the natural world in a much deeper way. And I think that's a very valid reason. Those John? Guys, I? John, can I? <laughs> yeah. 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 Can I? I just, I, I wanted to say. Wait, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds on that if you can, okay. and then I'll give you Adam as well. Okay, Ka Catherine and Anthony have continued to rely on state wildlife agencies and Anthony just said, well, he eats the meat, he's a locavore. That's a compelling argument. But those same state agencies allow commercial and sport trapping of animals. No one is eating those animals, the bobcats, uh, the beavers. And those animals suffer for hours when they're caught in steel jaw lake hole traps or conibear traps or snares. You're defending those agencies. Do you defend no utilization of the meat 
and animals languishing in traps for hours on end, with some states allowing trap check requirements gonna, of 96 I'm gonna hours. I'm going to stop you there because we're getting, that's a moral question again. It doesn't go to the question of whether there's conservation by hunters. But, but that was their exchange was the moral. I, I, yeah. I, I know it went in that direction, yeah. but okay. I, I'm going to. Sorry, John. Can I get are, you, are you going to relate it to our motion? Yes, yes. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. You uh, better. <laughs> so, sorry. Okay. Um, so two quick things about that exchange. One is Anthony has twice talked about hunters being natural predators, which I find absolutely astounding because the last time I checked, guns were not found in nature. So we're not exactly <laughs> natural predators. But secondly, and again, bringing this back to the motion, the motion is hunters conserve wildlife. And somehow we've gotten off on this tangent about hunting for food. Well, I would remind everybody that it's not just about what Anthony does or what the gentleman in the, in the uh, second row there who, who brings venison home for his family does. Think about people in Africa who kill animals for food. It's called bushmeat, and they're absolutely destroying the forests in Central Africa of gorillas and great apes and elephants and dikers and other animals for food. Those are hunters, and they are destroying wildlife populations in Africa for food, they're not conserving wildlife. Can I just can I just answer one thing real, very quickly? As long as it's really not about very quickly. Yeah, hunters. People have never been fast and strong. We don't have claws. We don't have teeth. We've always hunted by our intellect. Back in prehistoric times, in Indian times, what did they do? They light the whole forest on fire. They would knock birds off the perch when they were roosting. They'd smoke out a bear out of a den. But were they conserving wildlife? No, <laughs> no, no, they were, they were, please, believe me, they were, but the point is, we, he says our guns are not natural. We've I know, that, but that's why I, want, that's why I want to shut down this, this side of the argument, because it's not hunt. getting to our motion, and I want to get to the lady who was very patient. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's right. You I almost got Deb passed over again, okay. I know, um, Deborah Kane. I understand how you, <clears throat> excuse me, answered an earlier question explaining that uh, the financial benefits of an individual animal being, what it, I would call it killed, murdered, can benefit overall populations. But given that there are demonstrated successes in ecotourism, sustaining communities, um, I, I know personally photo safaris are very, excuse me, very expensive and- I, I need to ask you okay, to Okay, my question, question is, how does, given there are other options, how do you, how do you reconcile the term wildlife conservation while you're basically turning these lives into commodities to be killed to the highest bidder? Wait, wait. What? In, in, in North America? No, no, okay, just one more time. How do you reconcile wildlife conservation with what you're selling, which is... But again, I think that's a moral question because they've made the argument many times. It's an economic argument that they're basically making and they've, they've made it repeatedly. You may not right, like but it, no, but I my think... My question, I think it's a little subtle, but what I'm asking is how conservation is consistent with what hunting does, which is turn these lives into commodities. That's, that's the second time we've had that question come up. I mean, if you want to, again, I, I just feel in the interest of moving on. We've already heard the question, how can killing be saving? That be conserving is essentially that No, question. I'm asking how it's consistent to auction their lives off for a price consistent with, with the idea of conservation, which is, which is a different, subtle, but different question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass on it because I think they've, they've chewed through it, but thank you. Right down there, sir, yeah. Yes, you, the young, younger person. Um, I wanted to ask um, if there are economically feasible ways of controlling overpopulation. What population? Overpopulation. Economically feasible more, ways? More economically, or in terms of, um, um, in, because on non lethal ways would oh, require well, some funding. Well, let, let me, let, but, let me, if but, I can just say that for the predators, for wolves and lions, I don't think there's any ecologist who says they're overpopulated. I think that they control their own numbers, they maintain their numbers, and given all the threats that they're facing from habitat loss and poaching, as well as, in some cases, trophy hunting, they're barely hanging on. So population control is a moot point for so many of these predator species. Catherine, would you like to take on the question? You can pass if you want to. Um, no, but I can address what Wayne said. I mean, when it comes to wolves, I think one thing we need to, to recognize is since they were delisted and the state agencies open seasons, they've only been increasing in number and they've only been increasing in range. Now, when it comes to habitat threats, Wolves are highly adaptable. 
it's a, it's a myth that wolves are a wilderness dependent species. And anyone who wants to challenge me on that, I would say go to Europe. You'll find wolves in the suburbs of Rome. Wolves are opportunistic and they are, I love wolves because they can make a living anywhere. Um, now in terms of, you know, do we need to control their numbers? It depends in relation to what. You know, managers have different goals based on habitat carrying capacity. They want so many elk, so many mule deer, so many cattle. And they're going to control what preys on those animals in relation to what the other societal goals are. Um, now in terms of are there cost effective ways? Maybe. Maybe that's a great idea for a next prize. I'm going to look for one last question. Sir, blue shirt. Um, my name is Steve F. Um For the against team, I would ask you a question. Um, if Teddy Roosevelt, instead of, uh, instead of managing hunting, let's say he outlawed it. If there was no money coming in for conservation programs, where would we be today? How would we be funding? How would Africa be funding their conservation programs without hunting, without the millions? I, I don't remember the exact dollars, Billion but all the dollars billions that came in over the last 100 years from hunting. Okay, that's a great question. Yeah. Well, Teddy Roosevelt was, was an architect of the National Wildlife Refuge System, and even as a, as a inveterate hunter, he thought that there should be places where there was no hunting, and National Wildlife Refuges were set aside as refuges. It's only because of political lobbying that places called refuges are now somehow hunting uh, grounds. On the broader issue of license fees, you know, there are so many different ways that we can monetize appreciation of wildlife. And many states, because of declining revenue for hunting, take general funds uh, for the purpose of uh, supporting wildlife. And most of the endangered species programs come from those general funds, not from hunting uh, dollars at all. Catherine, Catherine Mercer. You know, w Wayne's hitting on something that I think is really important um, and some place where we might have some common ground here. The budgets for state wildlife agencies is declining. And that is a huge problem for every single one of us in this room who cares about wildlife. And there are other ways to monetize the enjoyment of wildlife. Something that the sportsman's community you know, has long supported is expanding the excise tax beyond firearms and ammunition to include things like kayaks and binoculars and tents and backpacks. And it's been really hard to get that th through Congress. And you know, I would hope that you know, should this come up again as legislation, both HS at US and, and Born for USA would support expanding that excise tax because there are other ways that we can monetize the enjoyment of wildlife and fund our agencies. Okay, we're coming down to the end of this round and what we're going to do, we call this the volley round. And in two minutes, we take on one question. It goes back and forth four times to the, each, four, each debater in turn. And they have only 30 seconds uh, to answer the question. At the end of 30 seconds, a bell rings, and they have to stop and let the other side start speaking. I'm going to tell you what the question is now. The question for our volley round is, wildlife would be worse off if legal hunting did not exist. I'll repeat it. Wildlife would be worse off if legal hunting did not exist. I'm going to start with this side, and I'm going to start with you, Anthony Licata. Your 30 seconds starts now. Yes, wildlife would be worse off if hunting didn't exist. Wayne has mentioned um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service several times. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has said repeatedly it's the funds generated by hunters that allow them to do their work and to manage wildlife habitats. They have said that hunters are the reason why we've gone from 10,000 elk to 120,000 elk. They're the reason why that have driven this great success of uh, great game populations that benefit all animals all across the state. Adam Roberts. <laughs> well, perhaps I could say incorrect 30 times over, but uh, no, wildlife would be better off if there was not legal hunting. I think I've used a number of examples from the Florida black bear to the wolves in Yellowstone that clearly show that even if hunting is lawful, there is still an impact on populations. And we can look throughout conservation history and see where time and time again that is the case. Remember, the example of the lion in Africa is of lawful hunting for 35 years that nearly decimated the population. That's not about poaching. Those are legal hunters. Catherine Semser. It would certainly be worse off. Again, the World Wildlife Fund report showed that in the absence of hunting, 74% of wildlife conservancies in Namibia 
would not be financially solvent. This is homes to elephants, lions, giraffes, all turned over to raising cattle. Is that really what we want? Or do we want those lions, those elephants, those giraffes? So not only hunters can enjoy being out in the wilderness with them, but photo tourists as well. Wayne Pacelli. Morning doves, uh, dozens of birds would be better off if uh, they weren't shot for target practice. Um, wolves would be better off if they weren't shot uh, for their heads. Uh, you know, hunting is going to be around for a while. There's a deeply committed small segment of the American population that favors it. But let's not make the argument because it's untrue that somehow this is a big protector of wildlife in general. It's not. And that concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our motion is hunters conserve wildlife. And remember, remember, please, how you voted before you began to hear the arguments. We're going to have you vote again right after this round. You're going to hear one more round, closing statements by each debater in turn. That is our round three, closing statements by each debater in turn. They will be two minutes each. They will be uninterrupted. Here making his closing statement in support of the motion, Hunters Conserve Wildlife, Anthony Licata, Editor-in-Chief of Field and Stream. I hope you'll vote yes on tonight's proposition because I think we've demonstrated with some simple, unassailable facts how sport hunting has and continues to conserve wildlife. Hunters continue to generate a billion dollars a year. They preserve tens of millions of acres of critical habitat. They've helped hundreds of species. I don't think those are any numbers to laugh at. But I'd like to close by talking about a more personal relationship between predator and prey. In field and stream, over the last 10 years, we've profiled about 150 regular folks who are doing exceptional grassroots conservation work. These are not biologists, they're not professionals, they're volunteers. These are people who care enough to spend their weekends building nesting boxes, installing water features on public land to help endangered animals. They work together to get different public and private groups to work together to preserve land so it remains forever wild. What these heroes of conservation have in common is their passionate love of wildlife and wild places that has been inspired and driven by hunting. It's simple, when you love something, you'll fight to protect it. I'm a backpacker, I'm a bird watcher, there's a lot of things I do outside. But for me, and 37 million other people like me in this country, there's something unique about hunting, the way it connects me to a natural ecosystem. It immerses me in the natural world and it makes me part of the system in a way that is ancient and really powerful. <clears throat> this gives me and millions of others me like this connection to the natural world. It makes me a participant and it opens my eyes to how easily man can destroy it by not protecting habitat. Look, hunting's not for everyone. It doesn't need to be. It shouldn't be. That's fine. People react to different activities in different ways but all of us need to work together to preserve habitat for future generations. And that would be much easier to do if we all work together towards the same goal. And that, more than anything, is why I hope you'll vote yes tonight. Thank you, Anthony Licata. The motion again, hunters conserve wildlife. Here making his closing statement against the motion, Wayne Pacelli, CEO and President of the Humane Society of the United States. You know, clearly there are, are many broad-minded, deeply committed hunters, and they do care about the environment, and they care about uh, protecting species. But overall, as a community, if there was a deeply felt, committed, practical understanding of conservation, the hunting community would not tolerate dumping millions and millions of pounds of lead ammunition to the environment that is poisoning millions and millions of animals every year. They wouldn't tolerate exotic game hunting on fenced-in enclosures, which is horribly unsporting and inhumane, but also threatens to, to uh, unleash invasive species into our habitats that has so many ecological consequences. If they had a deep commitment to conservation, they would be right by our side in defending the Endangered Species Act from so many attacks. They would have been right by our side when we worked to pass the California Desert Protection Act to protect eight million acres of the, the fragile California desert. Going back a little ways, they would have been at our side in 
defending and advocating for the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, the biggest public lands uh, protection act in contemporary times. When we're looking at the big fights for conservation, when we're looking at protecting predators like grizzly bears and wolves and mountain lions and African lions, they're on the other side. So, you know, as I said, hunting is a, is a long, storied action. There are lots of people who believe in it intensely. I get it. Those who are involved in food gathering, it makes sense in so many ways for them. But let's not mistake that activity, which contributes almost nothing to conservation, as some broader socially beneficial enterprise. It's not. Thank you, Wayne Pizzelli. Our motion, hunters conserve wildlife. And here making her closing statement supporting the motion, Catherine Semser, CEO, COO of Humanitarian Operations Protecting Elephants. You don't have to like hunting. And you don't have to like me. But you all do like wildlife. And that's what's really important. I think Anthony and I have really laid the numbers bare, the results of how hunters conserve wildlife. An area in Africa 1.7 times the size of the U.S. National Park System conserved, kept free of development, hopefully forever. Individuals putting a million dollars into restoring wildlife populations over 2.5 million acres of really remote wildland. Businessmen spending $100,000 a year or more on anti-poaching patrols. A huge system that works to keep hooves and claws on the ground. Because that's what really matters. It's not about me. It's not about Anthony. It's not about Wayne and Adam. It's not about any of us in the room. It's about those creatures out there. And to remove hunters from the ecosystem of conservation would be to sacrifice more than we can even imagine. So please, recognize what we've laid out. You don't have to like it, but please understand its value and vote in favor of the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine Zemser. And that motion is again, hunters conserve wildlife. And here, making his closing statement against the motion, Adam Roberts, CEO of Born Free USA and Born Free Foundation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I, I have to say, at this point of the debate, I, I'm slightly perplexed. And I'll tell you why. Because as I approached this two-minute closing, I heard two things, one from Anthony and, and one from Catherine. Catherine said, you don't have to like hunting. And a Anthony parroted that by saying, hunting is not for everyone. And I have to remind everybody what the motion is before us today. The motion isn't do you like hunting or not. The motion is do not do you yield food for your family by hunting. The motion is very simply that hunters conserve wildlife. And I set out at the very beginning of my remarks a very simple challenge. The very simple challenge was to explain to us all why we should simply trust that, again, politically, legally, economically, biologically, and logically, hunters conserve wildlife. And within each of those contexts, I set out a series of contentions, data, scientific data, not by my scientists, but by government scientists, by field conservation scientists, people on the ground that justify Wayne and my perspective in this debate, showing you that we can't trust politically that hunters are going to conserve wildlife because they're operating in places that are fundamentally lawless or filled with corruption, places like Zimbabwe or Tanzania. We talked about how legally you have people coming in and flouting laws to protect wildlife in order to get rhino horn back to Asia, fueling a market that also drives poaching in South Africa. Legally, there's no argument that hunters conserve wildlife. Economically, I laid out figure after figure, not just about what's happening in Africa, which was never refuted, but what's happening in Yellowstone with wolves and with the great uh, bear rainforest in British Columbia with bears. Not refuted. So time after time, what Wayne and I have showed you is that biologically, animals suffer, populations suffer, entire family systems and ecosystems suffer because of hunters. That is not conservation. That is the depletion of the natural world. And so at the end of the day, I put out the challenge that we can't just accept the fact that we should trust the arguments of the other side. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would say that trust is earned, and the arguments haven't shown today at all that hunters conserve wildlife. Thank you. Thank you, Adam Roberts. And that concludes our closing statements.
And now it's time to learn which side you feel has argued the best. We're going to ask you again to go to the keypads at your seat and vote a second time, but the same way as before. If you agree with the motion, hunters can serve wildlife, push number one. If you disagree, push number two. If you're undecided or became undecided, push number three. I see a few people are still working at it. A look of indecision on their faces. <laughs> but what was interesting in some ways, I saw the people voting more quickly than I've ever seen before in some other instances. All right. So we're going to have those results in about a minute and a half or two minutes. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I want to cover a couple of things. The first thing I want to say is I want to thank these debaters for the for the decency and the honesty, the civility and the passion they brought to this argument. They really kept it informative and intelligent. So thank you for that. And I want to say this because it's important. I know I threw out a few questions tonight. I meant no disrespect whatsoever. Um, it's just editing that I do on the fly about whether we're going to be getting into new ground. So the people who, who asked questions that got through, thank you for your great questions. And the other people, thank you for nearly great questions and also for the guts to get up and ask the questions. I appreciate that you did it, so thank you. Third important thing, I want to remind uh, people who are, are even our regular uh, attendees, but also newcomers, that Intelligence Squared U.S. is a nonprofit organization. We, we do this, uh, this, this event on a stage. We turn it into live streaming. We turn it into uh, a podcast. We turn it into a radio broadcaster and on public radio stations, and we give it away free. Uh, thousands of schools are using our debates now, uh, and we rely on donations from the public to keep us going. So we would really appreciate it if you liked what you heard tonight to give us some support going to our website and you can make a donation there. It would mean a great deal to us and would keep all of us human life continuing doing what we do. So thank you for that. We're very grateful to people who have been making contributions. I also want to point, I want to mention somebody who's on our staff um, because this is her last debate with us. Uh, her name is Adelaide Mandeville. I am not going to embarrass her by bringing her out on stage, but believe me, she's backstage right now and she's hearing this and her face is probably turning red. But uh, Adelaide came to us three years ago straight out of college um, and she has become an integral part of our debates. Intelligence Squared debates became better because of her contribution. We have a very small staff and she became a very big presence. So backstage, Adelaide, there's a room full of people here who are going to join me in thanking you for your contribution to IQ2 all of these years. So this is our final debate of the spring here in New York, but next month, June 8th, we're going to be in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center where we do strictly constitutional debates. The motions are always built off of some, something relating to one of the constitutional amendments generally. Up for discussion uh, in this debate on June 8th will be whether the executive branch has been guilty of overreach. Has the president, through a series of unilateral actions, usurped Congress's legislative power? Uh, among the debaters, as always there, we will have leaders in constitutional law. We'll be announcing our fall 2016 lineup coming this summer, but we're going to be letting you know now that we've been thinking about this and what we want to do is come up with a series of debates leading up to Election Day that are relevant to the conversations taking place in the presidential election uh, and that we hope will assist you in making an informed decision when you cast your vote on Election Day. And you can sign up for our e-blasts to get all of our announcements and you'll find out when we make our decisions uh, about, about what our topics are going to be. And as I've mentioned, for those of you who can't join our live audience here in New York, there are a lot of other ways to catch our debates. Uh, we have a great app, the IQ2 US app. It's uh, available through the Apple and Android stores. Uh, just look for the, the name IQ2 US on iTunes or on Google Play, and you can watch the live stream on our website. Um, we're also working with an organization called Newsy.com on a special series of what, what are constructed as two-minute debates. Um, and in the next, there are these debates turned into two minutes. And uh, in the next week, we're going to be releasing a whole uh, series of these two-minute shorts um, from uh, tonight's debate. So uh, take a look at, if you, if you want to share with your friends what it was like to be here, but you know they only have two minutes and you're on a phone and you're on the bus, take a look at one of our Newsy reports. And uh, you can also visit our website for up-to-date information on all of our upcoming debates. All right. I have the final results now. 
Remember, we had you vote two times on this motion, hunters can serve wildlife. You voted before you heard the arguments and again after you heard the arguments. And by our rules, it's the team whose numbers have moved up the most in percentage points who will be declared our winner. So let's look at the results of the first vote. On the motion, hunters can serve wildlife. On the first vote, 21% agreed with the motion. 35% were against. 44% were undecided. On the second vote, the team arguing for the motion, hunters can serve wildlife. From the first vote of 21%, their second vote was 26%. They went up five percentage points. That is the number to beat. Let's look at the team against the motion. Their first vote was 35%. Their second vote was 65%. They pulled up 30 percentage points, making the, argue, the team arguing against the motion. Hunters can serve wildlife, our winners. Our congratulations to them. Thank you for me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared US. We'll see you next time.